I'll be discussing statelessness and citizenship. Can I just get like a show of hands of how many of you would even know what that is just like that? Alright. Oh, I'm actually impressed with that, surprisingly. Um, so I'm just going to take a stab at kind of demystifying this and, and discussing um, a notion that I, I'm kind of leaning towards and possibly will be researching for my, uh, for my program in school. So we're going to look at this through the eyes of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I would like to, again, demystify this for you, so don't be scared by the big question on the screen. But I want to explore whether the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is contingent on the recognition of citizenship by the nation state. So if that didn't make sense to you, it's okay, we'll get through it. <laughs> so essentially, what I'm gonna look at here is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Essentially, they're in the preamble, it's everyone has these inalienable rights, uh, and they should be protected by the rule of law. Pretty standard things to look at. Uh, however, if everyone is kind of, and I'm just pointing there, I should probably move. So how are these things possible? How are these international uh, organizations possible? It's possible through member states getting together and agreeing to pledge themselves to these things. However, a sovereign state has the right to choose who they want their citizenship, uh, citizens to be. So for example, um, say I immigrated to Canada and they're like, well, you know, we don't want you to be Canadian, sorry. They have every right to tell me, well, you're not Canadian. So if the state has the right to decide who their citizens are, and they do, um, their, essentially their pledge is strictly for their citizens, the people they agree to give citizenship to. So what happens to the people who don't have citizenship? What happens to them? They have no host nation protecting their rights. So let's take a look at that a little more in depth. We're gonna focus on Article 15 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and we're gonna look at the fact that everyone has the right to a nationality, and that no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of their nationality or denied the right to change it. So I'm gonna take a second here and define what a stateless person is. Uh, so a stateless individual is someone who, hands down, just does not have access to their citizenship rights. Now, that might seem kind of simple to look at, but then again, access to education, to health care, um, to death certificates, birth certificates are often contingent on having citizenship. So you can see how that can become problematic. So while this is an issue that spans continents, um, I'm gonna take a look more centered on the region of Kuwait, which is where my family's from, so I have a, a little more of a personal connection there. Um, and we'll take a quick look at Burma, which many of you may or may not know about. But uh, we'll start here in Kuwait. So essentially, Kuwait used to be this, like, no one knows about it. Actually, the country is a little bit bigger than Ottawa, so it gives you, <laughs> it's, it's pretty small. However, um, before oil became a big thing, and, and there's a lot of oil there, it's, it is now the ninth richest country in the world. Went from being a speck of nothing to the ninth richest country in the world. However, at the time when, when it wasn't uh, a region of importance, there were the sea people and the desert people. So the desert people are known as the Bedou. So these sea people had two jobs. They were fishermen, and they extracted minerals from the sea. And they had plenty of money, and they were trading with India at the time, it was British India. Um, whereas the Bedou, the desert people, they were really just shepherds and they were very poor. So keep that in mind through this. Oil was discovered in the land, and then there was a British occupation, of course. Um, <laughs> at the time, they found this guy. His name was Mubarak Sabah, and he was kind of like the chief in the area. People had disputes, they went to him to resolve them. Uh, you know, it would, even the most minor thing, like, well, this guy asked for my daughter's hand, is he a good guy? People would go to this man. He was seen as, as, as a leader in the community. So the British, obviously seeing this, invested their time into the, to uh, Mubarak Sabah and his family. So we'll just call them the Sabah family. Essentially, the money started pouring in through the Sabah, and it was redistributed into the community. Trust was gained, and he was seen even more influential and more powerful. So in 1961, when Kuwait gained its independence, like a few years before, while the money was pouring in from, uh, specifically from the British, but also America helped out there, they um, put in an American hospital that's actually still standing, which is pretty cool to see. Um, however, they helped the Sabah family build institutions that would start off the government. And so these uh, ministries were built, and then hospitals and schools, everything was built in the region, which was before just kind of a desert and then a seaside. Um, so anyways, moving forward there, that was 1961, they gained independence. The Ministry of Citizenship was open for an approximate three months, no more and less. At that time, they gave out the first degree citizenship. So in Kuwait, there's first degree citizenship and there's second degree. First degree means you have the capacity to engage in political life. Second degree means you don't, you're just a citizen. You can reap the benefits, but you have absolutely no say in what goes on politically. Um, so the Ministry of Citizenship was open for a little while for the first degree citizenship. 
And so quite a few people got their citizenship, specifically the sea people who had the money uh, and who were close to the region. There was always a fee for the citizenship. Now the Bedou, the desert people, were poor. So they never made the trip out because even if they did trek across the country, they wouldn't have the money to pay for the citizenship. Uh, a little while later, another you know, bout of uh, citizenships were given out, and that was the second degree citizenships. Again, there was a fee, and it was much too high for the Bedou. So they didn't go. At that point, they were deemed stateless, and they are now known as Bedouin. Bedouin means without in Arabic, so essentially without a citizenship. Um, so at, let's say the first 20 years, it didn't affect them. They were still able to engage in trade. They were still able to access free health care, free education, um, the whole deal. Looking at today, uh, it started, well, let's say it started around after the first Gulf War. At that point, there was huge economic disparity between the two groups. Um, there was a social caste system put in place, which you can even see today if you uh, if you go to Middle East, specifically regions like Kuwait that are very rich, um, the social caste systems are, are actually very savvy to see. But, uh, so once that all came about to be in the Bedouin, the to stand up for the rights and, you know, like, you know, this is our ancestral ground, and all they did, they had no right to education, they had no right to public health care. Currently today, if you are Bedouin in the area, you will not be given a birth certificate nor a death certificate. You will not have uh, your license, like a driver's license, a simple driver's license, that won't be issued to you. Um, so as you can see, it's it's very hard for the Bedouin in this area because not only are they restricted in all these many ways, without a passport, they have no other options of where to live. So essentially their mobility is restricted and all their rights are restricted, and what are we doing about it? So that's kind of what I want to give you to put in mind for the, the Kuwaiti perspective. We're going to look at Burma a little bit to draw some parallels. And I'm going to skip through this really fast, so I hope you catch up with me. But essentially, British occupation, again. <laughs> I don't need to say much. I, I think, you know, just between us here, we could probably say that half the world's problems started with Britain. But, um, <laughs> so they brought in Indian administrators, and uh, that they were the ones who took over the, the, Bur the Burma region. Um, I believe Myanmar is not politically character, but I'm going to say Burma is what I'm used to. But, uh, so essentially, in Burma, there is a segregated population called the Rohingya. Now, the Rohingya are a Muslim majority population, and also that works into another reason why they're discriminated against and segregated. Um, so when, that, when Burma gained its independence, they rejected these people, and they live in the Arakan region here. But you can see there's a line going up here to Thailand, Malaysia, and Bangladesh. I thought that would have been more clear, but there you go. So the Arakan region is where the Rohingya uh, generally are situated, and they're coined boat people because they flee to those three areas every time they need to avoid persecution. So how does the, the, uh, the religious aspect pour into it? Well, Bangladesh is majority Muslim, and so for that reason they're often associated with Bangladesh. And what's going on today in Burma is that these, these Rohingya are being held in camps and tortured and being told the only way out is if you sign, off, sign away your identity and self-identify as Bengali. So essentially what, what the Burmese are trying to do is throw these people onto Bangladesh and tell them, you deal with them. Actually, just uh, I think a week or two ago, the Burmese government was quoted saying that they will not take care of the Rohingya, and if the international community cares so much, they can do it themselves. So that gives you a perspective of what's going on with stateless citizens. So what does that mean for us, and what does that mean for the initial question? If we have essential, inalienable rights, what is the use of having them if we have no access or right to exercise them ourselves? At the end of the day, the international community, such as like the ICC, the ICJ, the International Criminal Court, and, uh, Court of Justice, things like that, you cannot go forward with a case if you don't have a host nation that will stand by you. And if you have no one recognizing your citizenship, you can't just be a citizen of the world. I mean, it would be ideal, but we don't have that. Um, and so th this is where all the issues come into, t into play, because no one wants to do something for these stateless people. And then there's also political interests. I mean, in Kuwait, there's huge political interest in oil and in, uh, in various institutions there, so no one's going to question their government. Whereas when you move on to Burma, there's absolutely no political interest, so everyone's just going to turn a blind eye because it's not our. What are we going to do? Why should we invest ourselves? Uh, and I know that that seems kind of cynical to say, but I mean, we all we all have a view on politics. Um, <laughs> So essentially, all I wanted to do today was kind of inform you about what a stateless individual is, open your eyes to the fact that this isn't like they're illegal immigrants or refugees. On the contrary, refugees actually have their host nations protecting their rights and ensuring that, whereas stateless citizens are just kind of left to float across the world and 
are uh, completely dehumanized and they're not seen as persons in front of law, whether domestic or international, just the same way that women were once not seen as persons. So who knows, maybe you know, a couple of years from now we'll, we'll see how wrong that was, the same way we did with women, but as it stands, stateless people are not people of the law. <laughs>